Jesus, for you won victories for us over and over again. Oh, you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call my victory And all I did was 
Yeah. 
Come on over you. Let's press in for a moment. Tell him how much you love him. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We just take a moment to look at the cross and remember what you did for us. Even when we didn't choose you, you chose us. Father, thank you that we can rest in your love. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have our lives all together, Lord. We can come to the cross. We can repent. We can be transformed and we can live as a new creation this morning. Father, we thank you that you are good, that you love us and you choose us every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. And can we lift up a huge shout of praise to the Lord this morning. Oral Roberts University has online students in every time zone. While a future entrepreneur is researching before breakfast, a youth leader is listening to a lecture on the way home from work, an accountant is learning statistics on lunch break, and a psychologist is finishing an essay late at night, all at the same time. If ORU can offer 34 complete degree programs across 24 time zones, we can fit a spirit-empowered education into your crazy schedule too. Develop for the world, available to you anytime. ORU Online. Man, today, uh, my message title this morning is The Redeem Team. The Redeem Team. So, you know, one of the greatest things that I get to do here on campus is work um, directly with you guys. Every single day, you see me grabbing coffee at Hava, um, sometimes at Nords. Shout out to Nords. Um, I love getting to connect with you guys and learn about your dreams. Learn about what the Lord's put on your heart to do with your life. And I get to do that through two different avenues specifically. First of all, that's the chaplain program. Shout out to all my chaplains out there. And I get to also do it through missions and outreach. We love missions and outreach. Excited for our teams. Um, and you know, uh, as I was thinking about this message, what I thought was really cool was really all of us here at ORU, we're team ORU. We're all on the same team. We're all developing each other, engaging each other in our strengths and our passions and our giftings and our skill sets. Why? Because God has a calling and a purpose on your life. And he loves to fulfill those callings and purposes through community, through teamwork. You weren't designed to come here by yourself, be alone, figure it all out, and then go out. He wanted you to be surrounded by community. Everybody say community. And so that's one of my favorite things about Basketball, And one of my favorite things about basketball is you do things in community. You grow together, you sweat together, you run together, you bleed together, you win together, you lose together. All together, we do it as one team. And I, I think that's really a concept I want us to grasp this morning is that we are on a team and this is not a solo sport. Following Jesus isn't an individual task or assignment. It's actually a team assignment. And as a student of the game of basketball, I was studying in the history of basketball and some uh, childhood heroes that I had, and I found a really cool parallel from the game of basketball to us today as believers. So let me just read you this little story about the dream team. Anybody know about the dream team? Some of y'all are a little young. Maybe some of you over here might know about the dream team. <laughs> Um, it was the Summer Olympics in 1992. Anybody alive in 1992? Everybody over here. All right. <laughs> the uh, U.S. men's basketball team um, was, was winning in the Summer Olympics, but they realized they needed a kickstart, a little bit of fire, a little bit of rebirth in the program. And so they decided to put together what they called the dream team. So in 1992, they put together this team. And I think there's a picture we'll put up here on the screen. You may recognize a few players up there. Um, some of the most notable ones to me was Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Charles Barkley, Scottie Pippen, and of course, controversial statement, uh, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, uh, the GOAT. If you want to debate about it, we can go to Chipotle afterwards and we'll talk all about who you think is the GOAT. But we all know Michael Jordan is really the GOAT. This team uh, was the dream team. They came into the 1992 Olympics, and let me tell you, they stomped on all of the competition. They destroyed them. It wasn't even close. They were by far the best basketball team in the world. So 1992 happens. 1990. Six happens, 2000 happens. Each of these Olympics, gold, gold, gold. 
And then we get to the Summer Olympics of 2004. It was happening in Athens, and Team USA had dominated the basketball scene since 1992. But the funny thing is the world started paying attention. The world started looking at what this dream team had accomplished and the standard that had been set. And they said, we have to rise to that challenge. Many of the greatest players in the NBA today are international players. And they saw the dream team and they said, I want to be like Mike. I want to rise up to this standard. And so when the U.S. men's basketball team came in 2004, they weren't ready for the passion, the fire, the skill set that these other teams had brought in because they were watching some of the best players in the world, competing against the best players in the world, and finally they got to prove themselves as the best players in the world. However, the NBA players, the Team USA that came in 2004 lost. They only achieved the bronze medal in 2004. They were ashamed, kind of disgusted with themselves because they realized they had fallen below the standard, the standard that the dream team had set in 1992. This team in 2004 lost because they were casual, comfortable, and they didn't really take their opponents seriously. They didn't desire to win as much as they assumed that they would win. They didn't put in the hard work because they thought they were entitled to the gold. I would challenge us in this room right now that I think that little description could describe much of the Christian church today. I think if we looked at Christians in our culture here in the United States, we would say they're losing faith. They're not bold, they're kind of shrinking back, they're playing it safe, playing it nice Christian life. Why? Because they're casual, comfortable, not taking their opponent, their enemy seriously. Christians in our culture don't desire to know Jesus as much as they assume they already know everything they need to know. Christians in our culture don't put in the hard spiritual work because they think they're entitled to a comfortable Christianity. But I think when we look at Jesus in the Gospels, we see Jesus and we see his life, a perfect, sinless life, dying on the cross, rising again from the grave, he set a new standard for Christianity. And when, I, and when you look at his life, I don't see comfortability. I, I don't see casual. I see him taking the enemy actually very seriously, enough that he would go into the desert wilderness fast for 40 days and 40 nights, and when temptation came, he was prepared because he internalized scripture. And yet we have a church today that says, ah, the enemy, we don't see the demonic in the United States. I don't see demons, I don't see this. I wonder if we have a nice neighborhood, a nice family, a nice career, a nice marriage, a nice this and that. That's casual. That's comfortable, but you don't understand that we're in the middle of a war. Man, what more prevalent time to talk about being in a war than when one is actually breaking out right now. We're in a war, not just a physical, we're talking about a spiritual war. And many of us are like this team in 2004 that went to the Olympics that thinks they can just strut in and win the gold. But when you read scripture, when you look at the life of Jesus, no one's strutting around with confidence like they got it all in the bag. They're working They're pressing, they're interceding. And I know that's hard because there's fatigue. There's fatigue that comes on us when we see war and we see hardship and trial and tribulation and you go through things and it's hard because you just, I just wanna be comfortable. I just need to take a break. But let me tell you guys, Christianity is not a commercial. Christianity is not something that says, here's what you get. It just costs this. You get all this, it's a prize package, and we'll throw this in too. Christianity is not a commercial, it's a lifestyle. It's a choice, a daily choice to follow Jesus, to pick up your cross and follow him. And what do you get on the other side of that? Significance. See, because you were created to be significant. You were designed to design. You were created to create. Why? Because the creator, when he created you, said, I have a, a purpose and a plan, and we believe that. We say Jeremiah 29, 11 all the time, but if you really believed it, then you would take the cross seriously. You would say, I am made in the image of God. I'm about to step in to that design, that purpose. You have a gifting on your life. 
But we don't follow our giftings, we follow our Savior, and the giftings help us accomplish that purpose, that goal. I would challenge you this morning that the reason the church and that many of us in this room are limited to what we are seeing God do in and through us is because we have settled for comfortable Christianity, or let me put a different word, for apathy. We've settled for apathy because apathy, we know, is antithetical to Christianity. It can't coexist. There's no such thing as an apathetic Christian, really, because Christian means follower of Christ, and nowhere are you following Christ half-heartedly because he's going to tough places. He's carrying a cross. When he says, when the disciples say, let us sit at your right hand, he says, you don't know what you're asking. It sounds good. It sounds nice. It sounds like a nice position to be in at the right hand of Jesus. But do you know what you have to get through to sit at the right hand of Jesus? You saw what happened to the disciples, all of them, killed, martyred for their faith. This is what you get for being a disciple of Jesus. That's really tough to hear. (laughs) But let me tell you this. There is purpose in following Jesus. There is significance in following Jesus. And why do I give that gloom and doom? I'm not trying to give gloom and doom. What I'm trying to paint you is a picture that if you want significance, there's hardship. So we go back to this Olympic team. They casually walked in for that gold medal, thinking they had just earned it because they had USA on their chest. But they realized that wasn't enough. You have to put in the hard work. You have to define yourself as a team that goes low, that serves, that when there's a loose ball on the floor, you're not looking around to see who gets it. You're the first one to dive after it. So my challenge to you is how many of you are willing to dive for the loose ball? How many of you are willing to get on your knees every single morning and pray for a move of God in your life? You can't expect your teacher to do it. You can't expect your parents to do it. You can't expect your RA, your chaplain to do it. You can't expect even your best friend to do it. Are you willing to put in the work? Romans 12, 11 says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Don't be slothful. Be zealous for the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, Mm. but have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. Does that sound familiar to anybody today? Revelation 3.16. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's kind of nasty, Jesus. Why are we in your mouth, by the way? That's just... We'll have to study Revelation 3 a little bit after that. It is possible to sit in this room, to go to this amazing university, to come to chapels all the time and be absolutely lukewarm. It is possible to be surrounded by the most amount of teaching ever made available to any generation in the history of mankind through YouTube and Spotify and Apple Podcasts and everything you could ever want is at the touch of your fingertips. You can hear the word of God anytime, any day. You can read the word of God anytime, any day, any language in like a billion different translations. Did y'all know they had a pirate translation on the Bible app? Yeah, you can go check it out. There is a pirate translation. So I don't want to hear like, oh, the Bible's boring. Go read the pirate translation, y'all. I promise you, you will not be bored. I did it myself. It was actually really funny. See, there was a dream team called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they created a way for us. And we can either choose to be a part of this apathetical, losing mentality Christian team of 2004, or we can step into this new type of team that Jesus has created. It's called the Redeem Team. And the Redeem Team is actually right here from the Olympics in 2008. So the the, the U.S. team lost in 2004. And they said, we got to get our act together. We have fallen behind. We need to get some people on our team that are willing to put in the work. And so they drafted a new team, put a team together for 2008 Olympics in Beijing. And this team, they labeled the redeem team. They needed to redeem the golden standard that the U.S. had set 
for the Olympics. Some of the best players on that roster were like Carmelo Anthony, Kobe Bryant, Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James. Some of the best players that we know of today, this was when they were young and they were fiery and they were said, you know what? We're gonna go all out to represent our country. There's actually a story about Kobe Bryant that I love that it was one of their practice games and he was going around and he was practicing and so he was taking some dumb shots. You know, we all got the, the Kobe, the thing, you know, Kobe. It's because he shot a lot of bad shots, but because the Lakers back then weren't that great, and so he shot a lot of shots to make up for it. And so he was shooting a lot, and LeBron James went to Coach K, who was the coach at the time, and LeBron said to Coach, like, hey, you got to get this guy in line. You got to hold him accountable. And Coach K was like, I don't want to tell Kobe to be accountable. That's Kobe Bryant. He's scary. And you think Coach K is scary, but Coach K is scared of Kobe. So <laughs> Coach K pulls Kobe into the side room, and he says, Kobe, um, you know, I've just been watching your film. You've been taking a lot of bad shots, like a lot of shots that were forced. Man, you got LeBron James over in this corner. You got Carmelo over here. You got Chris Bosh posting up over here. Why are you taking these bad shots? I'm going to challenge you to take better shots. And Kobe looked at him, thought for three seconds, said, Sir, you're absolutely correct. I'm going to do that today. He walked out of the room didn't take a single shot for that entire game. And he went out on the court and he said, guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been taking some bad shots. It communicates I don't trust you. I'm gonna do better as a teammate. This is Kobe Bryant. This is a league MVP. This is a champion. And he's coming out in front of all of his guys. He laid ego at the door and said, I need to be better. If we're gonna win as a team, as a redeemed team, I need to be better. And so that's my challenge to you this morning as I kind of make this practical of what it looks like to be a part of the Redeem team. I'm throwing out the challenge to you guys. I'm going to ask that you leave your egos at the door and you said, you know what? I can do better. I can do better to help this team. Yeah, not just for me, not for my stats, not for my medals, not for my trophies, but I can do better for this team. So I want everybody this morning to put the right hand over their heart right now, right over there, and say, Augustine, I can do better. Now go ahead and turn to your, uh, your uh, floor mate, roommate, whoever's sitting next to you and say their name and say, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. Now that we've all committed to do better, let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture, and here's why. Because Paul is laying out a challenge for the Corinthian church. Paul is putting out a challenge saying, this is what it takes to follow Jesus as team Corinth, as the church. So let's read, and starting in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to receive the prize. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified from the prize. Gets me fired up every time. Let's look at 24 again. Do you not know that all of us in this room run the race, but only one receives the prize? So here's Paul's challenge to you. Are you running in such a way that you're gonna receive a prize at the end? Are you in it for a participation trophy or are you running for the gold? Because Christians that wanna be a part of the participation group they're not on fire for Jesus. People that pursue Jesus and say, you are all I want, and I mean it when I say it, when I sing it, when I pray it, there's a difference in that person. And you know, because you know people like that. You know people that, are, yeah, they're a little, they're a little extra. They're a little, they're, yes, you know why? Because Jesus has gripped their hearts. There is something different about them because something on the inside has changed. They're not jogging around with everybody else. They're running their race. I want to issue a challenge. I was a student here. 
For four years, I sat in the seats where you sat, and I saw friend after friend fall for the same thing. And the same thing was this. They rode the waves of spirituality of everybody around them. They never learned how to set the tone themselves. And so you graduate, and you're just like, oh, I just want to be outside the Oreo bubble. I just want to go. I want to go do my job. I want to be in career. I want to live in the apartment. You want to, yes, all those things are great. But if you haven't learned how to set your own standard, none of that matters. Because you know why? You're going to get to everything you ever wanted and realize you're lacking everything you needed. I say this because you gave me permission to challenge you. So I'm challenging you this morning. So what do you need? You need passionate engagement while you're here at ORU. You can be engaged but not passionate. You need to be passionately engaged if you care about making a difference as a part of the Redeem team. Number two, you need visionary self-discipline. Mm. Visionary self-discipline. Paul talks about how everyone goes into strict training. Guess what? You got a system of strict training right here. It's called HPE. <laughs> I remember running my field test. Crushed it. My first semester of my freshman year, because I came from Colorado, and my lungs were super extended because I ran in that mountain air, and then I came down to sea level, and I crushed it. And then there was like this thing called Christmas break, and then it got cold, so you know, you don't go outside. And then you come back your spring semester, your freshman year, and you're like, all right, I killed the field test in the fall semester. Pfft, I'm going to kill it now. So did I practice? No. Did I regret it? Absolutely, I did. I came to that spring semester field test, and I got a low C. A super low C. I think it was the lowest C I've ever gotten in an aerobic field test thing ever. I was ashamed. I felt guilty. And I had to do this thing called the fun run. You know, the fun run? And uh, there's nothing fun about the fun run. This is, this is nothing fun. It was raining. I had to, you know, jog around in the rain. And then I got up to a B. And I was like, I'm never doing this again. Why do I tell you this story? Because so many of us neglect strict training but we have a vision for what God wants to do in our life. There's a disconnect there. See, because if you have a vision for what God wants to do in your life, in your career, in your family, in your marriage, there's only one dedicated response, and that is self-control, self-discipline. I am choosing what I want in the future more than what I want right now. Because what I want right now is not to get up in the cold and come to chapel. I got some chapel skips, you know, I could just, I could do that. Or I could show up, press in, engage, and see what the Lord has for me this morning. It's going to take visionary self-discipline to be a part of the redeemed team. So we have passionate engagement, visionary self-discipline. And finally, if you want to make a true difference on the redeemed team, you need to value significance over success. It's not about us. It's not about our careers. It's not even about how much money we make. I hope you're a successful lawyer or doctor, a business person, an engineer, a social media influencer that changes the world. But if you are living for that, that's called misery. But living for something bigger than yourself, that's called significance. That's called purpose. That's called God's design for you. And so as I close this morning, I wanted to challenge you with these things because I believe we are a generation that wants to be challenged. And so I'm going to pray that God challenges you today, this weekend, and this semester to be an active participant in the Redeemed team. You can bow your heads. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for provoking us and challenging us, convicting us. And here in this place, Lord, we say, not our will be done, but your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In our lives, in every single area, challenge us to live a life of significance. We love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 
This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college, but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our Quest Leadership events. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered experience at ORU. Visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. Want to advance your career but can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu.